Lou Pinella, and welcome to okay. the historic Yankee Stadium okay. tour. All right. Have here in the Bronx that are uh, sort of our crown jewels, and the uh, New York Yankees uh, Yankee Stadium is one of them. Uh, besides the Botanical Garden of the Bronx Zoo, uh, this is one of the major attractions that helps bring in five million people a year in uh, in visitors. The New York Yankees actually got into the baseball business back in 1903, but prior to that, there were circumstances which uh, dictated problems that were going to unfold for the Yankees to start playing baseball. Baseball actually got its start in 1876 with the Cincinnati Reds, and uh, that was the National League. So for 25 years, there were many attempts at people trying to start an American League to go into competition with or gain some of the revenue that was uh, uh, feeding into the National League. Naturally, the people in the natural, uh, National League did not take this too kindly, so at every attempt they were thwarted in one way or another. But what happened in 1901 was a gentleman by the name of Ben Johnson, who had formerly been in the Western League, which was a minor league, decided that he could have enough clout to start a new American League. So what he did, he pirated some of the, some of the ball players from the National League, offered them some exorbitant contracts, and opened franchises in Boston, Philadelphia, G Detroit, uh, Baltimore, and uh, Washington. That was in 1901 and 1902. But what was happening, the people in the National League did not take too kindly to this. So what they tried to do was to usurp all of Ben Johnson's power by uh, negating any attempt that he, that he could muster to get the people to agree to a ball franchise, a ball club in New York. So what happened was Ben Johnson ran into two gentlemen by the name of Bill Devery, who was a former police commissioner and sort of a corrupt one. As a matter of fact, he was the most corrupt police commissioner prior to that. And uh, Frankie Farrell, who was a restaurateur and a saloon keeper. And uh, he got these two gentlemen to plunk down $18,000 to purchase a franchise for the New York uh, uh, American League. What happened here in 1902, um, John McGraw and the gentleman by the name of John Brush had, uh, pri uh, uh, John Brush was one of the gentlemen in the executive committee in the National League and John McGraw, who had been a, uh, a ball player with the Baltimore Orioles, was a tremendous umpire baiter. And what Ben Johnson was all about, he, he ran his league with a, with a tight iron fist. So when he heard about McGraw baiting these umpires, he constantly put him on suspension, which made John McGraw, who was a real hot-tempered Irishman, get more and more discouraged. And uh, he really, really tried to um, go against uh, Ben Johnson every way he could. So what he did actually was form a union with this gentleman from the National League Executive Committee by the name of John Brush. They purchased some of the best players from Baltimore and took them back into the National League, thus leaving the Baltimore franchise practically devoid of any major talent. What happened then, that opened the door for the New York American League franchise to come in, and hence we got the uh, Frankie Farrell and Bill Devery entry, and in 1903, the New York Yankees were, uh, well, it wasn't the Yankees at the time, it was the New York Highlanders uh, were born. They played ball in Hilltop Park, which is now on the site of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital on 168th Street down on 165th and Broadway. And the reason it was called Hilltop Park is because it is the highest point on the island of Manhattan and for the next uh, 10 years they started uh, uh, forming the franchise. With John McGraw still at odds with the American League, something happened here that, uh, that turned the face of the New York American League franchise around forever. There was a tremendous fire in the polo grounds in 1911 and in 1912 Frankie Farrell, uh, well at 
after the fire, uh, Frankie Farrell and Bill Devery offered uh, the Giants uh, Highland, uh, Highland Hilltop Park the opportunity to play there for a year. So they did. But at the time, there were more and more people that were coming out to the ballpark. So after that year, when the new, newly furb refurbished polo grounds came into existence in 1913, uh, John McGraw sort of buried the hatchet just for a little while and invited the, the New York Yankees now. Now, they, it's, it's very ambiguous as to when the nomenclature New York Yankees came about. I think uh, from what I've seen from all historical analysis that it was the local scribes that didn't want to put Highlanders all the way across the uniform, just started calling them Yankees, and they were really adopted about 1913. I think that is when it was uh, formally used. So in 1913, the Yankees started playing ball in the, in the polo grounds. Uh, and it went fine there for about uh, six or seven years until the 1919 Black Sox scandal, which was a tremendous black eye for baseball. Uh, people were losing faith and trust in the pastime, which had been, up until that point, been gaining in popularity so much so that it had been solidified as the American pastime. So what happened in 1919, when Babe Ruth came over to the Yankees in 1920, things started to change. But how Babe Ruth came about uh, uh, getting into a Yankee uniform is another great story. There was a gentleman up in Boston by the name of Harry Frazee who owned the Boston Red Sox. And he was a playwright. He had plays on Broadway. And unfortunately for him, they didn't do too well. But fortunately, for the New York Yankees, they didn't do too well. And the reason for that being is that uh, his first major play, which was No Known Annette, was a tremendous flop. So he turned to Colonel Rupert and uh, Mr. Houston, Tillinghast Homadieu Houston, who had purchased the team from, uh, from Bill Devery and Frankie Farrell a couple of years prior to that. And uh, they plunked down the money for Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth eventually turned the game around, but what was happening here was there wasn't only Babe Ruth, there was Wade Hoyt, Herb Pennock, Sad Sam Jones, Bullet Joe Bush, Jumpin' Joe Dugan. There were a whole bunch of guys that were coming down from Boston, and the Yankees were getting stronger and stronger, much to the dismay of Mr. McGraw over in the polo grounds and Horace Stoneham. Now, what happened was at the end of the 1922 season, the Yankees have been in the pennant now for two years. Their first two years in the pennant and World Series was 21 and 22. And they lost both of them to the New York Giants. And uh, uh, what we, they, would, they were starting to take a lot of the fans away from them. So McGraw and Stoneham turned around and said, look, you got you, you, you to get out of here. We, we don't want you anymore. Uh, but the team had enough foresight at the time, the powers that be for the uh, New York Yankees, were already looking for sites that were nearby uh, to the polo grounds because they wanted to stay as close as possible to their arrivals and, and in a suitable site where they had mass transportation uh, facilities. At the time, there was a lot of uh, uh, landfill that had been put in this particular area, which was at one time Cromwell's Creek over 150 years ago. And uh, back in 1841, when the New York Central Railroad was being built, the uh, landfill was coming onto the creek, which at that time I think extended up to about 164th Street. And uh, eventually, with the building of the subways in the turn of the century, more landfill and, and rock was added. There was actually a, uh, a, a, a lumber yard that was here uh, uh, prior to that. but. This land was the, the site where the, where the Yankees eventually came. And uh, you had facilities for three different mass transportation lines at the time, too. So it was ideal. And they were in stone's throw of uh, uh, Gentleman uh, McGraw and uh, uh, Mr. Stoneham. Much to the dismay of Mr. Stoneham and McGraw because they wanted him as far away as possible. R Babe Ruth is coming into the fore. Now, you have to realize the tremendous turnabout in baseball after that Black Sox scandal and the war, the, the, the uh, World War I, uh, had taken some of the uh, luster out of the game. Um, 
Babe Ruth's and, and, and uh, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis started turning things around and, and getting baseball back on the right track. And they did that with a little juiced up baseball. The, uh, the home run record prior to that was something like 14 or 16, which Babe Ruth hit while he was pitching for the Boston Red Sox. And uh, eventually when they got that juiced up ball, he started hitting 29 home runs. So he broke all records. Anyway, uh, 1923 uh, was the first year that the Yankees actually played in Yankee Stadium. Opening day was April 18th. Now, after they had left the polo grounds, as I was mentioning to you, with the foresight that they wanted a spot near, near the stadium, um, they had contractual agreements with the Osborne Engineering Company, a firm out of Ohio, uh, to build a stadium for $2,300,000. And um, that took exactly 284 days. No strikes, just a moral obligation to f fulfill their request and uh, their, sh their handshake. Uh, the stadium was under construction as of May 5th in 1922, and then was finished in the early part of April, almost a month prior to opening day. And opening day was April 18th of 1923, with Bob Shockey winning the first game. They beat the Boston Red Sox, how ironic, and uh, uh, Babe Ruth hit the first home run. So that was the start of what was eventually go, uh, coming into dynastic proportions. In 1925, they got Lou Gehrig and uh, a couple of other ball players by the name of uh, Tony Lazari and, and, and Bob Musell were coming aboard at that time. So by 1927, you had a real formidable operation here in, in this uh, baseball team, the New York Yankees. The New York Yankees. There is only one team in professional sports in America that has resisted the caprices of time and sustained an image so long that that image has now become legend, and that is the New York Yankees. And I'll give you just a couple of little statistics. Out of the 33 world championships that the New York Yankees have been involved in since 1921, they've won 22 of them. So it's 66% out of the, the ones that they've played. And that's between 1921 and 1981. So for those 60 years, there were teams that had won five in a row, four in a row, and uh, just, just solidified this team as, as the uh, most prolific team in professional sports. And they tried to maintain that image. Uh, basically, I would say between uh, the owners, uh, constant pursuit of the best ball players that were around uh, was the reason why the Yankees all through the years uh, were always on top. They had great owners with, with uh, even the guys that originally purchased it. Uh, then uh, Rupert, uh, Colonel Rupert, and uh, going on through the years, through the Dell Webbs, Dan Toppings, and even into the George Steinbrenner era. There was one bleak period in time between 1966 and 1972 where the Yankees did hit rock bottom, but that's because it was uh, operated by a conglomerate being CBS, which I don't think had as much interest in the sport of baseball as they did in their other ventures. As a matter of fact, in fact, I think it was more or less a write-off at the time. So George came back in 19, uh, came to the Yankees in 1973. He purchased it with uh, 12 other people for the price of $13 million and brought Gabe Paul along. And Gabe Paul, everybody knew in baseball that he was one of the best uh, general managers, wheel of dealers, and would close a deal with a handshake at a bar at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And he just helped perpetuate the image of greatness that the Yankees had been building up uh, throughout the years. Um, their record from 1943 to 1953, winning five world championships in a row, probably will stand for a long time because of the diversity of talent and the parity in the clubs right now. If you take a look at this past series here, you had two teams that were last that were playing the World Series for the championship of, uh, of baseball. So it's going to be really difficult for anybody to really uh, get that strong where they're going to take such a dominant role in the sport of baseball. Um, up until 1981, when they played the uh, Dodgers and lost four games to two, that space in that 60 years 
could you imagine being involved in the pennant 33 times? There are teams that haven't been involved in a pennant for years even longer than that. You take the Boston Red Sox. They, when they had Babe Ruth in, in 16 and 18, they were involved and they won the World Series. And since then, those poor fans in Boston, uh, which are some of the greatest fans in the world, uh, have uh, uh, nothing really to uh, clamor about. And we have 33 pennants. So... Uh, we have to be thankful for what's happening here. There's so many things that we could discuss about the New York Yankees as far as records and, and uh, uh, individual feats uh, and players that uh, we, we have come to know through the years, either through our imaginations, what we've read in the books, what we've seen on television, uh, or what we've heard about. Uh, we, we really can't get into too much of that. I just wanted to give you a brief history right up off the top of what the New York Yankees is all about. What I would like to do now is to show you some of this stadium where all that greatness and uh, all those championship years were formed and uh, I'd like to take you out towards the monuments and hopefully we'll run into a couple of people along the way to give you a better idea of what goes on for the production of the baseball, the game of baseball here at Yankee Stadium and we'll take a look at the monuments and possibly step out on the, uh, the clay portion of the dirt, come back through the dugout, stop in at the Yankee dugout and see who's in there and uh, go upstairs to the press box and maybe see a luxury suite or two. Yes? Where are we now? We're in the auxiliary clubhouse. This auxiliary clubhouse is used for, um, sometimes you have bands that play before the game or you have teams that play um, and this is this is what it is used for. Are we going to see the clubhouse? Yeah, we're going to take a we're going to take a look. They're going to have the door open. We could peek our head in. There is still a lot of uh, 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 personal mm -hmm. gear in there, so I don't know the extent of how much we're going to be able to get in there, but we will see it. And uh, uh, well, if you follow me, I will take you on out. What you see behind me here is a, a collection of really great individuals that were immortalized through the New York Yankee organization for one reason or another. And after uh, just a brief explanation about what went on with the other part of Yankee Stadium besides the New York Yankees, uh, you could have a couple of minutes to take a look at them. And then there's going to be a quiz. <laughs> I want to know who are the three ex-cardinals that are up here. Okay, so you could you, you could talk to each other, but by the end of this uh, next few minutes, I I want somebody with, uh, with with that answer. Besides the New York Yankees, Yankee Stadium played host to 30 professional fights, championship fights here, the Billy Graham Crusade the Jehovah Witnesses, which is still coming to Yankee Stadium. Many, many concerts, uh, most recently Billy Joel, uh, Nelson Mandela. We had uh, two papal visits, two masses here in 1965 and 1979. Um, uh, till this day, the uh, uh, some stadiums in the whole country haven't seen the popes, but we had them twice here. I think that's quite a quite a, a, uh, an indictment as to the uh, meaning of the mecca of outdoor sports here. Behind me, on, at the top of the scoreboard, what you see are the scallop facade of what is a replica of the old stadium, which actually ringed the whole stadium. It was copper. And when the stadium was refurbished in 1974 and 1975 at the cost of approximately $125 million, the copper was taken by the salvage crew and sold. But it was part of Yankee tradition, and we didn't want to abandon all of what had been in the old stadium. So this fiberglass portion is, is ringing just the scoreboard, which is... Uh, uh, from the right center field area to the left center field area. Uh, we have, uh, if, any, if we could s turn around and take a look, they're trying to welcome us. I see Bronx County Historical, welcome Bronx County Historical yeah, Society. Okay, uh, how nice. 
<laughs> this is Diamond Vision, and uh, we have the capability, the most modern uh, uh, facilities for instant replay and whatever um, electronic gadgetry you, you know, contemporary electronic gadgetry you have. Um, uh, what I'd like you to do now is just to take a look at and see on this marbleized wall what we have here, and then uh, we'll find out who those three X Cardinals were. Well, it seems that a couple of people have come up with the answer. And the three ex cardinals two folks and one, because of the greatness of some individuals that came through the Yankee pinstripes, Noah Huggins, the manager through the years from 1918 to 1929, who's the first pennants in World Series here. We have Babe Ruth and Luke Gehrig. Uh, they were constructed in 1932, 1941, and 1949, which was actually part of the playing field. But uh, I saw that. Right in, in center field, it was 400. The center field, we would go chasing him. I remember Jimmy Pearsall sitting on the monuments. Does anybody remember that? You remember Jimmy Pearsall back in the 50s? Sitting on the monuments. And, uh, uh, well, he was a case in, unto himself, but a uh, great ball player, really. Uh, and naturally, I don't know of another team that could that could stake this claim. And I'm proud to be here. Uh, where I'd like to take you now is back through and up into the press box, where we're going to find out a little bit about the production of the game. And uh, I mean, I can get all. A couple of other things that went on here at Yankee Stadium, which I, I failed to mention to you. Besides baseball, you had the football giants, which had some of their halcyon years here from 1958 to 1956 to 73, when they beat the Chicago Bears in the game that they came out in the second half with sneakers because there was a blizzard and they really <laughs> rolled over. And it was about 42 to uh, 42 to 15 or something. Uh, and then, then they eventually beat the Bears again, but uh, they were here for 15 years. And you had <coughs> soccer getting its rebirth here. 
with the, the great Pelate, who is probably the greatest individual figure worldwide known to the to, to the uh, to, to the sports world. And the Cosmos came back and played here from 1976. They played here for one year before going out to the Meadowlands. And in the Meadowlands, they it was a real great novelty to see soccer as something extra for the sports-hungry New Yorker. And uh, they were filling the parks, but it was just uh, possibly a little too uh, little scoring. There wasn't enough scoring, and it was constantly running back and forth, which I think the, uh, the people actually got tired of. And, uh, the demise was only about five years after that, but they had some real great years. Okay, if you follow... Yeah, they charge to advertise on the wall, then you have an idea of Citibank to run an ad like that, what would they charge for how long a time period? I really don't know. I would I would estimate in the $100,000 area. And uh, it's a yearly thing with a contract that... Uh, uh, with options for renewal, please don't uh, push that. How much did the side cost? I have no idea. Okay. No, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know what you pay for it, a square yard now. Do they redo it every year? No, what, we, what they basically do every year is at least the infield, and every other year they do the outfield. But uh, this is a beautiful diamond. And, uh, uh, well, this is Yankee Stadium here, without the poles that we saw. The stadium, which was built in 1923, did not have that left field portion from the foul line or the right field portion of the foul line out. That was built, that was built in 1928 from the left field foul pole out, and that was built in 1937 from the right field foul pole out. Sort of tailored to Babe Ruth's uh, needs. Well, that foul pole was further out. The foul pole was ball. just a few feet. It was just, just a, a few feet? Just a few feet. When that guy caught that ball running all the way back? That, you, I'm talking about Algie and Frito? Yeah, yeah that yeah, was... He, he didn't catch that by the foul pole. That was by the 402 foot right, sign. Right. I remember it, yeah. That was further out, but that wasn't by the foul pole. The foul pole at that time was 296 feet to left field, 301 to right field. Okay. <laughs> She's watching yeah, This is the Yankee Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah, we have some, the names are up on top of the lockers. What is this, Dad? The Yankee Well, that's that, these are all the cubicles where the ball players change.
This is this is for the media. This is where all of the press, as you can see on the labels in front of you, the various agencies that represent uh, uh, different cities around the country are right here. And uh, this is, uh, well, you have to take care of the press. This is about the most ideal spot in the ballpark to watch a game from. You have everything laid out in front of you. You're uh, uh, basically directly behind home plate. You can watch the balls break as they're being pitched. and. Uh, uh, naturally, you're covered, which also helps on the, the inclement weather. To the left, what we have basically are the boots, the control boots, where the uh, the organist is. Uh, Bob Shepard, the announcer, who's been here for many years. He's a, he's a professor of English out at St. John's University. And uh, the control room, where all of the graphics that are put up on the board come from. And that's right here. Now, if you just stay here one second, let me... And uh, Mr. Tim Beach, who is responsible for, as I mentioned to you before, putting the graphics up and all the information and all the colorful things that happen while the game is going on. Um, it's a very integral part of the game because people have something to focus on between the innings, and uh, maybe Tim could tell us a little bit about it. Tim Beach. Okay. As uh, Tony said, uh, my name is uh, Tim Beach. I'm one of the full-time staff of, uh, of three people here all year round and uh, my title is uh, assistant director of uh, video operations whereas we're responsible for the uh, writing pr production and the actual uh, taping of all of the Yankees r radio and t TV commercials and also along with our job is we're responsible for all of the uh, scoreboard and uh, in-house co communications for the uh, Yankees. Uh, for our board out there, uh, basically uh, you have your out-of-town board, which is off to regular regular store, uh, the Matrix graphic board, and the actual uh, Diamond Vision, which is turned on now. Uh, for something like that on, on a game day basis, uh, everything you see out there during a three-hour game takes about ten hours to produce. Uh, and for every 7.30 game, we're here at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning preparing for uh, that nice game. Uh, a full game staff consists, uh, along with uh, the three full-time employees, a uh, part-time crew of, of 10 people, including uh, the, uh, the organist and the public address announcer. Uh, each, um, each game holds always some, something uh, different because uh, as with baseball the game changes every, every day uh, along with the uh, statistics and uh, the players uh, one week one player will, will be hot so we'll try and turn our, our videos uh, towards that one, one player and it'll change as the season uh, goes along and uh, each year, uh, we, we belong to a, uh, a conference uh, called the Information Display and Entertainment Association, which is a, a membership of all the baseball, uh, football, hockey, basketball, etc. Uh, teams and arenas throughout the uh, United States and Canada. And every year, we uh, we get together in a uh, at the site of the uh, NBA All Star Game and we uh, meet, meet together, exchange ideas, and then we actually have a, a competition of uh, who actually has the, the best boards, what produced graphic-wise, and so forth between all of the uh, arenas. And at our most recent uh, uh, meeting in, in Dallas uh, in last February, 
Uh, the Yankees won t two awards as the best ov overall uh, matrix board, which is our se center board. It's, it's shut down for the, the season. We unfortunately couldn't ha have it on for you because it has to be shut down for cleaning during the, the winter. But uh, for that's basically where you'll see uh, if a player gets a hit, a home run, you'll see a, a cartoon an animation. We create uh, about 70% of those right here on a uh, on one of the com computers, uh, which is a form called di digitizing, where we actually have to draw the, the pictures and then uh, you copy it frame by frame, and it makes the, an a animation. Once you go through about 50 frames or so, some something like that could take anywhere from for a simple five-second animation can take approximately about three days to make. And uh, <coughs> we won for that. That was uh, the best overall matrix out of all the teams. And for our Diamond Vision, I'm sure you've uh, all been to games within the past two seasons, and we have something called the, the Subway Race. Right. Shown on the, the Diamond Vision. That won uh, last year's uh, best overall uh, half in, in, in segment. Number four was the winner? Uh, yes, the four. <laughs> <laughs> But not, but not this year. We let the, I think we let the C train. Finish this year. Te technical difficulties, and uh, it was really our, our first year uh, entering the, the competition because it was the first year that we really felt confident that we had the best op operation in baseball, and I think we still do now because uh, I myself came on this. I'm going into my. Uh, my third season here and uh, the gentleman I work with has been here for five seasons and we were the first uh, actual people with video experience that were hired by the, the Yankees. Be before that uh, there was just a, a daily game crew that was hired to work it and the only thing really the boards were used for was for replays and, uh, and stats and we like to give in. When you come to a game, we try to make it as uh, entertaining as possible because along with uh, the big t TV contracts spells longer games. And so while you're guaranteed two minutes between each inning, we try to make it as, as entertaining as possible for you. Who takes care when the kids are on? The picture of children on Diamond Vision? That's all created in here in our uh, control room. Well, he had two kids that were on it. Us two kids. Last year. Last year? Right. And any faces I know? Uh, no, Mr. Franzini. Mr. Franzone. His own. Yeah. He was he's, kind enough to. Yeah, he's, he's the, the he gentleman. He gave us I, two days, actually. I, I work with. While, while we're standing here in the, the sub Arctic temperatures, he's in Orlando, Florida. Just <laughs> oh, <laughs> to make you feel good. But. Uh, I have the dolls on. So the Cabbage Patch dolls. So please mm -hmm. tell John I was here today. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll pass that, that on to him. Is there any legal team rule of policy concerning replays as far as controversial plays? Or replays or? is uh, question. The, the teams, you're basically on your own. The, um, the league does have gu guidelines where they ask us not to put any close calls up uh, that would, uh, would could o overturn a call. Uh, any call at first base or any uh, play at the plate will will shy away from showing it unless we will watch it back first in the, on our, our replay. And then if, if it looks good, we'll, we'll put it out because on several occasions we'll have uh, an umpire call and say, why did you play that? That's a close call. And just so the fact that we know how fans can get uh, could in, incite a, a small riot or just a, a situation that uh, that uh, is not in the best interest of uh, having fun here. Uh, the the Mets had a, an incident uh, this, this summer where uh, whereas they showed up a play and the, the they were totally in, in the, the right. The umpire was in in the, the wrong this time out. And what happened was the umpire called up and demanded that they shut the board down for the, the rest of the game. The Mets com complied because they weren't really sure of the rules set forth by the, the league. And that's what they basically worked themselves into an embarrassing situation. And the umpire, in return, wound up uh, apologizing to the Mets organization for uh, 
overstep in his bounds. But uh, we just uh, will never let a, a replay go that's close without looking at it just for the sake of avoiding any type of friction with the umpires or the opposing managers. Well, the umpire is always the winner. Whatever True. Says, that's it. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank uh, Tim Beach and give him a little hand here. And uh, Follow me, I'm going to take you down to the luxury suite. We're going to see what it looks like where the hoi polloi gather. <laughs> Tim, if we need tickets, we can say to you for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out here today, November 5th, 1991, my birthday of the year, and I'm not going to tell you what that is, but I uh, uh, just wanted to give you an idea of what we have here in the Bronx. Uh, thank you once again.